Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the International Cannabis Conversation on Trichomes.com and powered by the Global Cannabis Network Collective. My name is Chris Day. I am the co-founder of the Global Cannabis Network Collective and really happy to be here this week with um, someone that represents a company I've tracked for a number of years in the international cannabis landscape. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we talked to folks from uh, Brightfield who had co-authored a report on European markets back in Q4 of 2020. And at that point, we had asked about their sort of co-creation partner, Hanway Associates, and today I'm talking to the CEO of Hanway, um, George McBride. Thanks so much for coming on. Um, I'm really interested to hear sort of your perspective on the European markets and the work that you guys have been doing. Um, but George, I, I'd love to first hear a little bit in your own words about Hanway because you guys are engaged in policy and license consulting and you put out a ton of reports and information to educate people. Um, how do you describe Hanway? Because to me, you're a big umbrella. Yeah, um, well, that's a very apt analogy, and we'll get into that. But um, thank you first for having me on the show, Chris. Really appreciate it. Love what you're doing and really happy to be a part of it. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, that, that umbrella thing is a, is a good place to start, really, with Hanway. So I met my co-founders who are... A, a guy called Alistair Moore, who's a creative and a scientist called Dr. Henry Fisher. And we met on a small street in London called Hanway Street, um, which is a little back alley that links Soho to an area called Fitzrovia and is full of interesting little bars and interesting little companies. Um, and we read into the kind of history of the street a little bit and um it's called hanway street after a guy called jonas hanway who was uh notorious for being the first gentleman in london to uh carry an umbrella and at the time that he did that um umbrellas were seen as things that were for um prostitutes and frenchmen so they were ridiculed widely um, anyone who used an umbrella. And there was a, a profitable trade for um, people who operated the coaches in getting gentlemen out of the rain and transporting them around London. So there was a vested interest, which was anti-umbrellas. There was a lot of stigma surrounding umbrellas. Um, and here was one notable philanthropist and entrepreneur who said, Do you know what, this is convenient and I'm going to use it and I'm going to take the flack. And we saw a lot of parallels between that <laughs> and what's going on with cannabis. You know, we saw this as something that was going to be, you know, someone carrying an umbrella in London is not unusual. I'm here in February. It's been raining every day for months. Yep. Um, and so now that's just a ubiquitous scene in London. And we really felt the same thing was happening with cannabis. When I was a child in London, if you smelt cannabis, you'd be like, oh, and you could smell it and then you'd be surprised because people were quite clandestine with their use. And now, even though we've only got a fledgling medical cannabis industry, cannabis is becoming a lot more mainstream. People are much more open about their consumption. It's something you will smell uh, if you walk around the streets of London for more than about two minutes. You will smell yeah. it. Um, and we saw that change. We liked what Hanway represented and that's why we gave the company that name is you know we want to be part of pushing away the stigma and mainstreaming this into a, a normal reputable sector i love um i spent 20 plus years in advertising agencies before i really shifted um fully into working within the cannabis industry i love companies that have stories behind their names it provides so much sort of extra energy and enthusiasm. I also love the fact that, um, you know, we've shifted controversies over the decades from umbrellas to cannabis and overcoming stigma. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it's, funny, it's right? great to think, though, that, a, that an umbrella could be something that was once, you know, a stigmatized uh, thing. But, you know, these stigmas are very they transigent, you know, they yes. pass through and they, they shift from from generation to generation. 
Well, we can look forward to uh, whatever the next one's going to be. I tell people if we don't have something to get upset about, we will find it. So let's uh, encourage people to move past being concerned about cannabis. But, um, you know, beyond beyond the history and name of, of the company, I, I find that intriguing. You're helping people overcome challenges all the time. I mean, what triggered my outreach to you um, originally in the last couple of weeks was a story about um, company um, Northern Leaf, right? And the fact that they were, are the first um, company in the British Isles to receive a license to commercially supply cannabis in 20 years. Um, that's quite the story. And you guys really are about breaking down stigma and helping companies to overcome challenges. Why did that take 20 years? Uh, to get to that point, and how how did this finally get done? You've got me started straight away on quite a contentious issue over here in the UK. So there is still a huge stigma around both the consumption of cannabis and working in the industry here in the UK. Um, to the point where part of why we had to call it the company Hamway Associates is every other cannabis business at the time had cannabis in the name and was shouting about it in 2015, 2016, 2017. Uh, and we couldn't get a bank account with a name with cannabis in it. Right. You know? So we were aware of these barriers and they're at every level, you know, just from day to day complacency and prejudice through to systems that were designed to stop anybody being able to conduct any cannabis businesses. And the main system we've got here in the UK is the Misuse of Drugs Act. And that is what, you know, controls, restricts trade in cannabis and other controlled substances. Um, and back in 1998, the Home Office, our regulator, um, gave the very first research license to GW Pharmaceuticals um, to do, at the time, what was quite a small research program, but run by two quite reputable uh, biotech. Uh, entrepreneurs here in the UK and they managed to get a license to start growing this plant um, and looking into its medical effects and they've been on an epic journey now um, so in the news yesterday I think people will have seen that GW has agreed a sale um, to Jazz Pharmaceuticals which is a brilliant name for a pharmaceutical company that didn't have anything to do with cannabis until <laughs> yesterday um, and All they yeah and yeah. um so they've been on that huge 23 year journey from being the lucky recipients of the first license uh, and now only just as they're in some senses ending their journey for those founders and entrepreneurs. Um, now we're starting to see the second wave and it's taken that long because, you know, GW did a good job in terms of pursuing their own interests and they got in and they got the license and the licensing framework has been very restrictive ever since. So you need to have reputable people who are working with you to assure the home office that what you're doing is a hundred percent legal. And obviously, unfortunately, the nature of cannabis reform has meant what a lot of cannabis companies do isn't a hundred percent legal, even right. if you're in California or Colorado or some well-established market. So there are a huge amount of compliance problems. Um, and then in the UK, it, it has just been impossible um, to get licenses for more than a handful of plants. So we've seen people set up research programs and we do have really good biotech sector here though. So there have been some licenses, but nearly all the licenses uh, of any note have been associated with GW. So the people who grow their cannabis for them uh, and their other partners, uh, but now We've got this interesting legal system over here where we've got these crown dependencies um, like Jersey, Guernsey, the Isle of Man, who aren't part of the UK, but they're also not totally independent. So they're not signatories to the UN conventions on uh, drug control. Um, they work with the UK for reporting to the UN. So they um, have now all got excited about mostly the financial opportunity that cannabis presents you know these are sure. offshore you know tax havens some people would call them um that are just right on our doorstep 
but they're now built their own system to say, right, medical cannabis is here. We want to profit from it. We want to be leaders in this field. Um, and they've managed to set up their own licensing framework, which has been backed by the Home Office in Jersey. So it seems to be that the Home Office was comfortable with, you know, the uh, longstanding um, biotech entrepreneurs that had got in early um, and is now moving to be comfortable licensing businesses just on the edges of the UK, you know. Yeah. Um, so this is the beginning. The Isle of Man will be setting up their system properly soon and we'll see more licensed operators operating on the fringes of the UK um, as this is sort of slowly creeping its way into to, yeah. to mainland. You know, I, I have two questions out of that. One is sort of a... Um just a verbiage question when you're talking for those who aren't necessarily fully aware of sort of the governmental structure and all that when we talk about the home office um we're not talking about someone sitting in their living room because of the pandemic it is um instead sort of the regulatory body is is our understanding is that correct yeah that is there are a number of other relevant regulatory bodies but the home office is the main one who's in charge of things like immigration, drug control. You know, they're quite a, a serious institution over here that's responsible for a lot of domestic policy and regulation. Yeah, I, I think it's, I mean, it's aptly named. So, right, we just, every, um, every country that I talk to or work with, everybody's got their own... Um, their own different group. And so it's always kind of handy uh, to, to describe to listeners which who's named themselves what in their, the approvals. But talking about uh, sort of the market opportunity, because as you mentioned, you know, these new frameworks are being established on the fringes of the UK. Um, they're not going to grow just for their uh, local population. So the what is the plan? Like, how do you make money if you're cultivating um, in, on the Isle of Man or Jersey? Uh, what's the what's the long game to make sure that you've got markets big enough to actually sustain your operation? Well, that's it. So that's quite an interesting challenge for companies like Northern Leaf. Northern Leaf, obviously, in a great early mover position, having secured the first license. Um, and we were very happy to, to help play a small part in that for them. Um, but they have a, a, a mammoth task ahead of them because, as you, you rightly noticed, they have to not only supply these markets, but help them open up. Um, and that means uh, that they've got a much wider role than just, you know, manufacturing these medical products and, and wholesaling them. They have to work with their distribution partners, their um, clinical partners, with everybody who is helping try and improve access to medical cannabis to open up, you know, this market. And th there is a great opportunity there because we have millions of people in the UK using black market cannabis for medical conditions. So there is already, a, you know, an active market there. It's just that they're obviously procuring that from the black market. So the UK market is growing very rapidly from very, very small when it first started in earnest in, in 2019, a handful of patients to um, very slow start 2019, 2020, but now um, forecast to grow very rapidly this year, even by the UN is now, I think, forecasting 2.7 tonnes of legal cannabis consumption in the UK. So Jersey has a market there, you know, there's going to be 2.7 tons of product that needs to be supplied to UK patients. We might have around up to look around 20 tons that need supplying to the German market. Um, and then, you know, you've got another up to 10 tons in various other legal um, European markets. Now that's quite small. Obviously, if you're looking at this comparatively to, you know, the scale of the opportunity as, as adult uses regulated in New York or something like that. But there is a viable market there. And the interesting thing is that that potential is huge because of the tens of millions of people who are currently accessing these black market products and just need the you know, education and support to help understand how to access this through legal channels. 
And just last point on that is that UK-based business, EMAC, um, who are doing very well, have a very competent team, they're now undercutting the black market in their prescriptions to UK patients. So there's an incentive now that's only been there for a couple of months, which is not only, you know, you could get better stuff through your doctor, but actually here saying not only is it, you know, potentially safer um, and, and certainly there's more you know, evidence around its safety, it's also cheaper. Um, and that's something that some of these suppliers can be doing. So that's a, a great change for, for people in the UK that you can actually get it cheaper from your doctor than your dealer. Yeah, the laws of economics, if they can work in your favor, tend to tend to be really good for expanding legal markets, right? If you can price it. Uh, safety and price all through legal channels. Why wouldn't you do that? There's always going to be yeah. somebody who won't, but um, it certainly crushes black markets quickly um, when you can do that. I think, you know, I'm I'm based in Denver, Colorado. And so when you look at the prices here versus what are frequently seen as overregulated markets like California, much smaller black market in one state than the other, simply because people are going to search out the best deal. So, um, yeah, I was not, go ahead. Sorry, Chris. No, I was just going to say, I think found that Colorado, that's quite fascinating. And I saw the rebound in, um, you know, wholesale prices are much stronger now in Colorado and they're managing to maintain low prices for customers, decent margins for the producers. And it seems to have stabilized and become um, something that's a really good business. And I think a lot of people kind of laughed off cannabis saying, oh, it's going to be, you know, pennies to produce a flower and there's no money in in growing cannabis. And that hasn't been the case in Colorado from what from where I'm sitting. No. And I mean, as you look at states and countries and everything, I always find it interesting, um, you know, when we create these markets within silos um, and you don't have the free trade across countries that you might want, uh, or states um, or provinces, depending on where you're at. Um, it's an interesting test in, in micro economies, really, that we can develop that way. Um, I think all, all things change uh, when you have federal legalization in the United States and then you have the expanding cultivation regions happening in places like South America, right? Um, we get front row seats to sort of the changing dynamic, I think, over the next couple of years when you go from siloed markets to more global markets. Um, I'm excited to watch it. I think um, there's a lot of people who don't quite, aren't ready, but they will just have to figure it out as it comes, right? Yeah. Um, and let's see how soon that'll be. Who knows with the incumbent government, we might actually have some reform. Yeah, I think we'll get some reform. What that looks like um, is still to be seen. But back to let's let's look at Hanway a little bit more and sort of look at our crystal balls if we can. Um, and the nice thing about crystal balls is we can always claim they're a little hazy. So if we're right or wrong, um, it's OK. So it's just speculation at the moment. But from Hanway's perspective, what, um, what do you see as sort of the near-term future for the UK, but then also um, Europe as a whole, and um, you know how that market's likely to interact with places like Israel and Africa as all of this emerges? Yeah, great. So we, we, there's some interesting stuff going on at the moment. Like I said already, we're now seeing prices lower in the legal market than the black market. We've now seen the national, uh, you know, a national police association backing a decriminalization campaign, basically, which is issuing uh, cannabis cards to patients so that they won't be prosecuted. So what we're seeing at the moment is this kind of wave of de facto decriminalization, so much less um, punishment for people using cannabis. Meanwhile, we're seeing a much better understanding from patients that actually, even though prices were very high in 2019 and early 2020, now, now they can uh, move over. So we're expecting rapid growth of the UK medical market over the next few years. Um, and 
the, how that will be supplied is still quite an interesting question. Even operators in Canada have really struggled to supply European markets because of the demanding pharmaceutical you know, compliance standards that you have to adhere to. Um, and I was doing a bit of crystal ball gazing a good few years ago at a Lyft conference, I think in 2016, mm. 2017. And there was a lot of people um, saying that the whole European market was going to be being supplied by these huge greenhouses in Canada. And I, for once, was accurate and said, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> um, and lo and behold, a lot of those facilities that they were talking about are now shuttered or they're growing leafy greens or bell peppers or whatever else. And yeah. a, a lot of that didn't happen. And that rapid globalization of the supply chain really hasn't happened in the way a lot of people were touting it. But I think a lot of that touting was you know, stock promotion and people uh, pursuing their own interests rather than a lot of legitimate feeling that there was going to be a big globalized medical cannabis supply chain. The reality is it's that local operators know the regulations better, they know the market better, and they end up producing the product that the market wants. So, you know, Bedrican ends up doing very well in Europe, EMAC ends up doing very well in the UK. These are fairly obvious things that, you know, people yeah. operating in their own country know their own market. But I'm expecting as a result to see some success in these, um, you know, offshore cannabis farms in the UK that are supplying the UK market and other emerging European markets. Meanwhile, though, the recreate the adult use reform is is slow, um, mm -hmm. but that's going to change. I think in the UK, we're you know looking like we're in trouble. Obviously, this is you know somewhat of a leper colony adrift from Europe at the moment in a lot of people's eyes. Um, and we have a lot of work to do to rebuild the economy after this crisis. Yeah. And there are strong voices in favour of adult use regulation. So I still maintain my view that I think UK will be one of the very first countries in Europe to, to legalise adult use. Uh, meanwhile, the Netherlands is building their experiment as well as the success with the Northern Leaf licence. We were lucky uh, enough to have uh, advised one of the first uh, 10 companies in Europe to be given a license for adult use recreation, uh, adult use cultivation in, in yeah. Netherlands. So that scheme is kicking off. They're starting to legalize the supply chain. For those of you that don't know, it seems like Holland, the Netherlands has had legal cannabis forever, right. but actually um, those shops are legal but um, all of the products are produced on the black market. Um, and so that's a, this strange situation that's been the case for 50 years that they're finally trying to fix, but very slowly in little increments. Yeah, that is such an interesting story. I was in Amsterdam um, a couple of years ago talking to some shop owners um, and rightfully so, right? They, they weren't always all that comfortable about having their names in print and that kind of thing. Because if you ask them, well, how does the cannabis get into the legal shop? It was like, it's a miracle. It just happens. <laughs> um, because, you know, nobody wanted to out sort of the, the confusing process of what is clearly a gray market um, situation there. So it is nice to see that progress happening. And and getting the whole discussion out in the open. Um, yeah. yeah, because of course, people have been going to Amsterdam to consume cannabis for decades. And Yeah, and, yeah. and it's unfortunate for the business operators because they have, an, whether it's gray market or not, they have an established supply chain, customers mm. who come wanting specific products. And it's very difficult for them to say, no, we want this new legal system, which will inevitably take years to unfold because they've got to turn their back on on their existing profitable company and try and rebuild their whole supply chain from scratch so you can see why there's resistance to reform from cannabis businesses there's resistance to reform from some cannabis customers there's resistance from the anti-cannabis brigade then there's you know and there's all this resistance from different areas and the problem of fixing it and making it all totally above board never seems to be the most important problem. Um, right. So, but finally it's happening. And so what we're seeing is the first 10 fully legal adult use 
European businesses, which is huge, you know, because once it starts, then that's when the, the ball starts rolling and gathering pace. So right. we're at that beginning right now, you know, and that literally happened a few weeks ago. So it is the beginning of the adult use opportunity in Europe. Um, and that, I think, uh, is going to take off in some places. And in others, we've, we're still waiting for reform. The Luxem Luxembourg dragging their heels somewhat. So this won't happen overnight, you know, um, but it is now finally happening. Yeah, well, I'm I'm glad it doesn't happen overnight because you know this this podcast is only every week, and so it takes me some time to get around to everybody. But um, it it's going to be an interesting region, of course, to watch. And um, I I do tell people that in many ways, as I talk to companies in Europe, um, it it gives me hope that we can establish globally sort of uh, recognized quality practices, safety practices, that there are countries really focused on the pharmaceutical aspects and benefits and educating people in the research. So it's, it's coming along slowly, but you can see the benefits of establishing these pilot projects um, that each country is doing. Because, you know, in North America, it's frequently just throw it against the wall and see what sticks and we'll figure it out as we go which um, is one way to do it, but you don't actually end up with um, very synchronous markets as that happens. So yeah, um, it's a, diff we'll it's a difficult it. balance. I, I feel like some places like Switzerland have gone too cautious. You know, yeah. you're talking about a 10 year pilot with a huge amount of spend, which is admirable on what the public health impact is going to be. How's this all going to work? But meanwhile, you're committing to 10 years without legalizing and all of the harms that we already know are involved in that you know we, we we're aware of the damage which pro completely prohibiting very popular substances does to countries you know destabilizing countries the death associated with the black market supply chain all of the ill-gotten money it's it's a huge problem that doesn't really need you know 10 years of research to figure out on the balance whether it's worth legalizing you know i think sure. we we can argue in good faith over how this reform should take place but the the argument for for not reforming is um it's lost really yeah in my mind it's dead i mean i know people are going to continue to to fight for a while but um the discussion on whether or not reform should happen is over the question i think is how right how yeah. does it move great. forward so great well, listen, um, George, I know you've got um, a lot of time constraints and busy, so I'm happy that you were able to carve out some time to talk to us on the International Cannabis Conversation. Um, I am excited to continue to watch uh, Hanway and all of your work uh, in, in the European market. You know, if there's one sort of final takeaway that Hanway Associates is looking at continuing to champion in the next um, 12 to 18 months, sort of what would that be as we close out? Um, what's sort of that, that thing that you're watching and tracking most? I think oddly, because we've been so focused on Europe all of this time, the, the thing that's really pressing on my mind at the moment is we are watching these new markets, um, which are going to open up this year in the US. Um, we're very interested to get involved with businesses who are going to be, you know, uh, operating in these new markets. And it seems like the time for building like real international cannabis companies is, is finally upon us. And um, if there's anyone, you know, out there in the US who needs to better understand how to operate businesses in Europe or wants to be partnering with European businesses for US operations, speak to us and um, our eyes are really turning, turning state wise this year to um, see this tremendous wave of reform that's coming over there over the next 12 months. Yeah, well, being in it, I am also anxious to see how that plays out. And I know um, 
the of GCNC members that we have as part of that organization, there are a lot of companies that, of course, are focused on uh, what those steps are going to be. And I should probably take an episode here in the next couple of months to talk about that interactivity um, as as we move in that direction. Um, so thanks for that. And thanks again for the time, George. It's been great talking. and. Um, I think we're going to probably try and have you back on here in a couple of months as things continue to evolve. Um, it'd be great to, to dig into that discussion on the interactivity between Europe and North America and everywhere else as well. So um, thank you. Thanks to all of our subscribers and listeners out there. Um, please do continue to tune in to the International Cannabis Conversation, and we look forward to talking to you next time.